like my, I think the um, longest faculty so far. Right. We came here 30 or more years ago. 35. 35 has always been in the Chair of Admissions. He was the one who called me that I got accepted to PhD. <laughs> uh, he's a very well established researcher in genetics. So he's going to talk to us, to you, uh, about his journey in general, right? So these journey lectures are here for you to kind of know what are the different stages for professionals in statistics and how uh, similar are all, in a way, but how unique also they are, you know? And I uh, really want to thank you, Mike, for, for doing this. And so yeah. Well, thanks very much for... <laughs> So it's really a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, this program, BDSI, is something that's really close to my heart. It's something that uh, I've wanted us as a department to do forever. Um, Bramar came and decided she would do it. I'm a firm believer that for things to happen, you need a champion. She's been a champion to make it happen. And so I'm really glad to see you all here for this uh, most recent cohort for BDSI. I hope you're enjoying yourself already. Uh, I hope it turns out to be a great time overall. Um, You've got great faculty, great staff working with you, and uh, I hope you I hope you enjoy it. I hope particularly you enjoy the Michigan weather starting today. It's been a pretty crummy spring from the perspective of weather, and today is stunningly beautiful. I don't know if people know about the Ann Arbor Summer Festival, but that is on, and please do take advantage of it. I'm going to go there myself later this afternoon. So, <clears throat> Trevor said, the idea of these journey lectures is to give you a notion of something about what we do as biostatisticians, but also how we got to the point of doing it. And so you can see pictures up there, uh, two, one of them, I'm, I'm one year old in one of them, and three years old in another. Um, and, then, and then more recently, maybe that other one is, I don't know, a year or two ago. Should we turn off the front lines? Is that going to help here? Is that better? Is that better? Okay. <coughs> And so, as Peter said, I've been here for a long time. I joined the faculty at Michigan in 1984, um, but did a lot of things before that. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, uh, home of the University of Oregon. Um, my dad was a printer, a Benke Printing Company, after his father before him. And I actually worked at Benke Printing Company from the time I was in the seventh grade until I graduated college. That's how I paid for college. Um, it also taught me very quickly that I didn't want to be a small business person. Business, the customer is always right, but they're really not, and you have to pretend that they are. And there are just issues with that that didn't work very well for me. Um, my dad was the best boss that you could imagine, but I also learned that I didn't really want to have a boss. I had two siblings. Uh, my brother died uh, when he was 30. My sister is still around, and we interact a lot. Uh, those are pictures of our family. Um, I went to college at my hometown school, the University of Oregon. Um, I was there from 1973 to 1977. I was a math major. I always had liked math. I, it seemed obvious that I, I should do math. And, 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 and so that's what I did. I majored in math from the start. I was part of the Honors College there, which gave me sort of a small college feel and what was a pretty big university. Um, I, I really focused on having a broad liberal arts education. Um, and I'm really glad that I did, because in everything I do in science, the fact that I have a broader education in terms of communication, in terms of literature, in terms of the arts in general, I think that adds to what I experience as a person, as well as a scientist. <clears throat> and so my plan A was to be a math major, which I was. But then I got to about my junior year, and I was doing well. Um, and I started thinking, well, what am I going to do with this math degree? And it showed a certain lack of knowledge or self-awareness, but I had no idea of what I wanted to do. And in fact, it was, I always say it was a crisis, because people undergo way worse crises than this. But for me, it was a crisis, because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I finished college. And so I thought, well, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I was very active in politics. All of my friends, it seemed like all of my friends were going to law school. And so I, I actually seriously thought about doing that. And in fact, I took the LSATs and applied to law schools and was ready to go. But in my, my last semester, actually, term at the University of Oregon, I was talking with a biologist, this guy right here, Bill Bradshaw. 
um, who I'd actually volunteered for. Uh, he does, he, actually he still does, he's still active, he's a professor emeritus in it. Um, but he does picture plant mosquito um, ecology. And so I, I, did a, uh, I did some work with him as a volunteer, and, 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 and Bill said, as I was you know, pondering what I wanted to do and thinking about law school, deciding that's what I was doing, he said, Mike, you really ought to combine math and biology. That would be a really good fit for you. I said, well, Bill, I haven't had biology since seventh grade. And he said, who cares? And I said, who cares? I haven't had biology since seventh grade. How could I possibly do that? Um, that was a really important 10-minute conversation. I had another really important 10 minute conversation about a month before that, where Ed Diller, the other guy pictured there, who was the director of our honors college, said, Mike, you ought to apply for Fulbright Scholarship. I said, Well, Bill, those are, uh, Ed, those are really hard to get. They're very competitive. He said, Apply. So I did. And uh, the lucky fact was, I got the scholarship. And so I went and studied for Germany for a year. <coughs> and that gave me some time to think. I spent a couple of months at a Goethe Institute learning German. I knew a little bit of German before that. I still learned only a little bit of German while I was there. I'm not particularly gifted at languages, but uh, I then spent time at the University of Freiburg in the southwest part of the country. Took a variety of classes. One of the really nice things in Germany, if you're there for a year, is they really don't have any tests. Uh, those come in blocks later on, and so I can just sort of go to class and travel around and have a really good time. But it also gave me time to think more about Bill's advice and other things I might do. And so I decided, who cares? Um, I'm going to uh, 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 consider combining math and biology. And so I took the GREs in Heidelberg. That was back in the days when you actually filled out a paper test and you could only do it one day a month and at home very specific places. Um, I bought a book called Biological Science by Keaton, and I started reading it. And when I got to the chapter on genetics, this is probability. And Mendel's laws really are probability models. And I'm good at probability. I like probability. And I also read about ecology and epidemiology and things. And, and so this was seeming more plausible to me um, as I went further. And so I actually applied to graduate school at UCLA in their biomathematics program, University of Washington in biostatistics, and I chose UCLA. And I chose UCLA because that particular program said, you're going to have to learn a lot of biology. And I thought, well, that would fit, because I don't know any biology at all. And so a program that will require me to learn a lot of it seemed like a, a logical fit. And so I went to UCLA. I uh, met uh, Ken Lang, uh, who became my graduate advisor. Um, Dan Spence was my second advisor. Uh, Neil Rich and Dan Weeks are my academic siblings. They overlap with me. We're still good friends, and we still interact a lot. A really key event while I was at UCLA very early on was Ken actually went on sabbatical to, um, to Boston. And initially, I was sort of unhappy with that. That seemed unfortunate. You know, I just started working with him. It was going really well. Um, and a guy named Henry Tuckwell, who's a neuroscientist, uh, actually came to visit as a visiting faculty member taking Ken's place for the year. And Henry said, you guys don't have a journal club? Well, you don't have a journal club. And Mike, you can be the first presenter. And that doesn't seem like any big deal, but in those days, I was pathologically afraid of public speaking. The idea of getting in front of an audience, even half a dozen people, let alone 50 people, let alone 1,000 people, which I do periodically at this point, <clears throat> was impossible. How could I possibly do that? Um, and so I gave the talk a week later. It was terrible, but I didn't die. And people asked questions. And I actually answered some of them successfully. Um, and so by being forced to do that, it gave me a chance to think about the kind of career I'm doing. Because as someone who's pathologically afraid of public speaking, there was no way I was going to be a faculty member. If it hadn't been for Henry, that, would, that wouldn't have been possible. So I owe him a lot, too. I decided when I was in graduate school to do statistical genetics. Now, I was interested in that based on the, the reading in Keaton, where I first read that genetics chapter. And it seemed cool because that probability model, of course, not all of genetics probability models, is really based on those. Um, and I was fortunate enough in my first semester to have a class with a guy named Bob Jenrick, who's that fellow. Um, and I needed a class project. 
And Ken, my graduate advisor, was sitting in on the class and said, Mike, you know, I just got a grant and I've got a project uh, that I need someone to work on. You could use it for the class, and I could also pay you a stipend of 325. Sorry, I could also pay you on top of your 325 month stipend, which is what I was getting to live in Los Angeles. And even in 1984, $325 did not go very far in Los Angeles for a month. It basically paid for one room in an apartment. So for lots of reasons, including good science, but also including economy, uh, this seemed like a great idea. And what worked out great is I liked Ken a lot. I liked the project. We developed software that actually is still in use, although it's gone on for multiple different generations, called Mendel, which is a uh, software package used for the analysis of family data. Um, and so I chose genetics, partly because of this hard project, partly because I met and liked Ken, Sometimes things, good things happen. You just sort of go along and things work out. And so that was good fortune again. And I should say, if at any point you have questions, don't hesitate to, to stop me. I'm more than happy to take questions at any point. And honestly, it would be way more fun than a lot of us. Please do interrupt. I had my first uh, internship working with a guy named Dick Gaddy. Uh, he was a lot younger at the time, but this is the picture I could find. Um, Dick is an immunologist and a geneticist, and he was working on problems having to do with the human histocompatibility system, the HLA locus. Now, HLA has a whole bunch of genes, and the variants you have at those genes determine a lot of human immune response. And in particular, he was interested in a gene that he called HLA-D, that the, the field called HLA-D, and I did some well, reasonably good work figuring out how to help classify genotypes at this complex locus. The paper was published, and I'll show you that thing in a, uh, in a moment, the cover of it in a moment. But what's funny, actually, in retrospect, is there is no HLAD gene. There are actually several HLAD genes, and so we were trying to do an impossible job to, to determine someone's genotype at one gene when actually it was at least four or five. So if your assumption's wrong, whatever comes later might also be wrong. Also, I did other things. I played a game called Adventure, which I think actually is, well, I know it's still available on the internet. It's sort of uh, antediluvian at this point, uh, but it's quite fun. That was the cover page for our paper. Um, your career is really important. I encourage you to find something that truly you care about and pursue it. Um, my career has always been second most important to me, or actually third most important. Kids would come in second. First and most important is my wife. Betsy and I met in graduate school. Uh, we met, had our first date on May 10 of 1980. Uh, we were engaged on May 20 of 1980, and we were married on September 21 of 1980. Um, I've always been sort of a slow to act person, and people will tell you I probably still am, uh, but sometimes you know something is right, and uh, 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 you make choices. We're still married, very happily married. Um, Henry's advice, Henry Tuckwell, when I, when I announced in class, because this was a small class, we were all good friends, that, that I met someone and we were getting married, they said, well, who is it? Because they didn't know uh, who it was. Um, and Henry's immediate advice was, well, don't get married, because he just had gone through a messy divorce. Um, <coughs> some advice should not be taken. After, after convincing him I really was going to get married, canceled class, and took us all out for beer. Actually, champagne, as a matter of fact. Um, Ken's advice, a little more practical, um, was anytime you're going anywhere, the two of you both need to give talks. Because Betsy was getting her PhD in epidemiology, uh, sort of women's health kind of epidemiology, infectious diseases. I was getting mine in statistical genetics. So it was clear we were going to be looking for two jobs in relatively you know, obscure fields in the same place. And so that was Ken's advice, is anytime you go anywhere, give talks. And he arranged for us to give talks in a bunch of places. Um, and that ended up being quite important, because one of those places was Ann Arbor, um, which then ended up leading us here. So while I was in graduate school, I did lots of coursework. This is a new program, and uh, the basic philosophy there was if something was useful, require it. And so we had lots and lots of coursework. I did two different qualifying exams, one in biomathematics, one in genetics. 
The genetics one was an oral exam. That was one of the least pleasant experiences in my life, or at least one of the scariest experiences. It turns out to be just fine, but um, I was not excited about doing that. Um, it was really great to be in an apartment where we had lots of interaction with the students, lots of interaction with the faculty. I was in Ken's office every day, and that was an incredible luxury, an incredible opportunity to, to be able to do that. Um, I gave talks at the American Society of Human Genetics. I wrote a bunch of papers, most of them with Ken. And when we finished, um, we had multiple offers for postdocs, um, and we also had offers to come here to the University of Michigan. Um, and we chose Michigan. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, Ken always arranged talks. I went to American Society of Human Genetics meetings in Detroit in 1982. Um, Ken arranged for us to give talks at the U of M. There weren't any jobs available at that moment, but later that year, jobs opened up in biostatistics and epidemiology. And I interviewed for the one in biostatistics and got it. Um, and basically, our reason for picking Michigan was we were looking for the best sum of two jobs in one place. Betsy got a postdoc initially, and as soon as uh, they opened up another faculty position, she got a faculty position. She's now a uh, full professor also. In fact, her office is just directly above mine, which is quite nice. Um, we chose it also because it's a great university. And we chose it because it really felt like a place that we could enjoy living. Um, Eugene and Ann Arbor are certainly not the same, but they're both smallish towns, well, small cities, college towns, really nice places to be, with lots to do, lots more than you can do back in a small city. And so it was an easy choice to come here. I don't think we ever imagined we'd be here 35 years later, and that our kids would be Michiganians, and that our grandkids, even, are Michiganians at this point. So, we started here in January 1 of 1984. It turned out that that was the coldest winter in 50 years. So I brought my Southern California girl, Betsy's from Southern California, I brought my Southern California girl to Michigan. We were walking on the beach in Santa Monica one day, and it was 72 degrees out. We were walking in the snow in Ann Arbor the next day, it was 22 degrees out. And it just got colder, it got to minus 21 Fahrenheit three weeks later, and Betsy looked at me and said, what have we done? Uh, but we happily had really warm coats, we were well prepared. Uh, and there were lots of good things about coming here. We were immediately welcomed in the faculty, uh, lots of nice interaction with lots of different people. We are a much smaller department then. We now have about 40 faculty, we now have about 200 students. At that time, I was the 11th or 12th faculty member of the department, depending on how you count it. And so when you have a small department in terms of number of faculty, there are certain things that an academic department just needs to do like teach classes, like have various uh, different committees. And so in my first three and a half years here, I actually taught 11 classes of them, seven of them different. Um, I don't think anybody else in the department can make that claim. I hope not, because it wasn't a wonderful thing. On the other hand, I got to teach things that I really cared about. I got to interact with a lot of our students, as well as getting started on my research. So that was really nice for me in that context. Um, again, Life isn't all about work. And so again, the second most important part of my journey, besides marrying Betsy, was having uh, three sons. Our son David was born a year and a half after we got here, then Kevin came a little later, then Richard after that. Um, they're not kids anymore, they're grown-ups. <clears throat> but we still had a lot of fun interacting with them and, um, and really have totally enriched our lives. Uh, Kevin, the middle son, uh, actually lives in Ann Arbor, uh, got his PhD here in environmental health sciences, and now has a faculty position in the medical school. And he's the one with the two uh, children, so those are our two grandchildren. <clears throat> Besides getting set up in the department and getting started on teaching and starting a family, um, as an assistant professor in biostatistics, it was my job to start doing research. And actually to continue the research that I started with Ken, but to develop my own research program. And so this is the, uh, uh, the title of the, the first paper, first methods paper that I did on my own, basically, where it was no longer um, being helped along the way by, by Ken as my graduate advisor. And that, that's a big step, because it's great, you know, as a graduate student, I just walk down the hall every day and talk to Ken, he'd have great ideas, I'd say, great, I'll go try that. He'd help me along in places where, where, where I was having difficulty. 
you know, when you go off and you start as a faculty member, it's your job to come up with your own problems and go forward with them. And so this was a problem that uh, came to me as I was doing a study where we were trying to do to map a gene for a disease, disease called neurofibromatosis. Um, and I wanted to evaluate how much information the families we had available to us would provide to help us identify that gene. And so that's where this particular paper come from, came from. It was published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. It was really my first independent methods paper. And it was the basis then for writing my first grant. I wrote a grant to, to what was then called the National Center for Human Genome Research. Uh, it was funded. And honestly, and I've had that grant and its successors now for, for 30 years and, uh, and funded for three more years. So that's been, that's been really good fortune. It was also the basis for my first student, Lynn Plowman, uh, for, uh, for her dissertation. And as a biostatistician in a biostatistics department, part of what we do is, is develop statistical methods. And so my methods focused initially on different problems in genetics. Again, how we deal with family data to help identify genes that influence disease risk. Um, I had problems working on optimal design of family studies. I worked for a substantial period of time on a, a method for gene mapping called radiation hybrid mapping. And Kathy Lynetta, who was the one on top there, that was the subject for, for her dissertation. Basically, it was a way to order genetic markers along a chromosome using um, hybrids between human and mouse chromosomes. <coughs> uh, cells, I should say, and the chromosomes within them. The other thing that I started on my research when I came to Michigan was, was doing what statisticians call applied research, what the rest of the world called science. And, and that was trying to identify the genes that were relevant for different human diseases. This is Francis Collins. He and I arrived at Michigan the same year and been collaborating ever since. He's gone on to bigger and better things. He led the Genome Project. He's the uh, head of the uh, National Institutes of Health at this point. Uh, but we continue to work together on, on work in diabetes that I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, this was total serendipity. I didn't know Francis was moving here. I didn't even know who he was at that point. And, and he certainly didn't know I was moving here or who I was. But by arriving in a good place at the same time, being introduced, talking about our work, it was clear that there was some logic in us working together. And, and, and that's been really great. This is the, uh, a takeoff on a bumper sticker that was present in the 1980s. I think the actual quotation was, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Um, I've never really liked the idea. But what I do like the idea is, if you have really good people to work with, you're much more likely to be successful. And even if you're not successful, you're much more likely to have fun. Um, and to me, fun is what, what my work is all about. Hopefully doing something useful. So over the years, from the time you know, I got here in 1984 on for many years, a lot of us were working on this problem, trying to identify genes that were involved in different diseases. Most of us started with what we think of as simple Mendelian diseases. Diseases like cystic fibrosis or neurofibromatosis or Huntington's disease, one or one or two bad genes make it essentially certain that you'll get disease. Those diseases are really important for the people who have them, and in aggregate, they're really quite common, but overall, they're a relatively small part of the public health burden. And so, what we then tried to do was to use the same kind of methods that we've been successful with for simple and dealing diseases to try to help understand more complicated diseases like diabetes or many forms of cancer or heart disease, the common diseases of humanity that have a huge burden on the public health. And the unhappy fact was, for a long time, we didn't make much progress. We looked and looked, we worked really hard, but didn't make much progress until a, a new technology came along that uh, enabled it. I'll get that, back to that in a little bit. In about 1992, uh, Francis and I were sitting in his office. Um, he said to me, no, Mike, when we study diseases so far, we have let people come to us and say, let's study this disease, and we said, sure. And that's how we ended up doing neurofibromatosis. that's how we ended up doing breast cancer. Um, 
Francis said, what we ought to do this time is decide a disease we want to study and then go do it. I said, Francis, that's a good idea. Why don't we choose some criteria for what makes a good disease to study and then let's go back and think about it and then let's come back and decide what we might want to do. He said, fine. So we came up with some criteria. Um, came back a week later, and I said NIDDM, and he said NIDDM. We come to the same choice. NIDDM, we don't even call it that anymore. It's non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. It's not what we call type 2 diabetes. And so we made the decision we wanted to do that. Um, and that was a matter of making that happen. It just so happened that I was invited to give a talk in Helsinki, in Finland, later that year. I met Jakla Tomletto, the guy on the, on the right side in the upper row. Um, and we decided it might be interesting to work together. So Jakla came and visited the States with me and Francis. Um, Samitra Ghosh was a postdoc. Uh, um, Beth Hauser was a graduate student. Rich Bergman we engaged because of his knowledge of physiology. And so we formed what we ended up calling the fusion study, a study that actually still goes on today. It's gone on long enough that Karen Mulkey was a graduate student when it started um, and is now one of our principal investigators. She's a full professor. Uh, Laura Scott joined us here at Michigan uh, about 15 years ago. And Mark Uloxo, who is the head of something called the Medicine Study, is also involved with us. And so this is a team that works together to try to identify genetic variants uh, associated with type 2 diabetes, to try to understand what is the genetic basis for type 2 diabetes and, 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 and diabetes-related traits like glucose and insulin and body mass index and lipid levels. And so that's what I'm going to talk about in terms of my research for most of the rest of the talk. I'll get back to some of the others a little bit, but this is what I'm going to focus on because this is where we've invested a lot of effort starting in the 90s um, and, and going on till today. Any questions so far? I can rattle on forever, but if there are questions, that would be great. What are the criteria for choosing type 2 diabetes? So, what were the criteria for choosing type 2 diabetes? We wanted uh, a disease that we thought was reasonably accurately diagnosed. We wanted a disease that had a large public health impact. We wanted a disease for which there was relatively little competition um, because we were still thinking like the millions at that point that, you know, if we found a gene for neuro, if someone else found a gene for neurofibromatosis, then we couldn't find it and we lost the race. Okay? Um, really good that that turned out there ended up being a lot of competition because all our competition became our collaborators, but some more of that later. Um, and those were the main ones. Other questions? Actually, by the way, how many people are in the genetics group for, for PBS science? <clears throat> so, so fusion started out as a linkage study. In linkage, we look for the co-segregation of disease and genetic markers. And we make the inference that there is dependent transmission down through the generations. Then there's a gene, a disease predisposing gene near the genetic marker. And that allows us to infer locations of disease genes. This is the way we had worked on all the different Mendelian diseases and had great success. It didn't work so well for complex diseases. So here in fusion, we started out sampling 5,000 people, actually more than 5,000 people, in more than 800 families in Finland. All those families had at least two affected siblings. Many of them had more affected individuals. Finland is great in the sense that people are incredibly cooperative with biomedical research. We would send uh, queries, or actually the, the people's uh, physicians would send queries asking, would you like to be involved in this study? We're looking for families with at least two diabetic siblings. Um, we got a 70% response rate for, for those queries. What's particularly well, that's just by itself amazing. You wouldn't expect to get anything like that just about anywhere else. What's amazing is far fewer than that people had diabetic siblings. And so we had many responses saying, well, I don't have a diabetic sibling, but if I can be helpful, let me know. Um, Finland is a wonderful place to do biomedical research. 
We got a lot of trade information on these people. And we genotype them for what were called microsatellite markers. So places, about 400 places in the genome where there were um, different lengths. And we could uh, reproducibly determine the lengths and use that to trace inheritance uh, across the different members of the families. This slide summarizes about eight years of work. Um, it's a sobering fact that in one slide I can show you eight years of work and have it show you nothing. Um, the scale here on the uh, y-axis is called a lot score. It's actually a misscale of light the ratio statistic. Along the x-axis, we have the human genome, chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3, and so forth, up to the x chromosome. Um, a LOD score of 3 to 3.6, depending, is viewed as significant evidence for the presence of a disease gene. Here on chromosome 11, we got a 2.98, which is not to say that wouldn't be interesting. But in fact, if we go back and look at the places we had evidence, there really isn't anything going on in terms of the genetics of type 2 diabetes. 500 families plus 300 families get 800 families. So 800 families, about 5,000 people, we had essentially nothing. Uh, in our work. That's Sumitra Ghosh, that's Paisa Salander. They were postdocs involved in the project. So we decided, you know, if 5,000 people wasn't enough, let's talk to all the people we know who are doing this kind of work. And happily now we had lots of competitors, in fact, um, and brought people together. We had 20 different groups, in fact, represented at the next American Society of Genetics Union. And every group said, yes, we want to share data, we want to work together. I think everybody at that time had realized we can fail separately, or maybe we can succeed if we work together. <coughs> so we got together data from these 20 different studies, more than 6,000 families, more than 30,000 people. This is that LOD score again. It never even got to two. <coughs> Francis Collins uh, is a big fan of Churchill and likes to quote Churchill. And so in those days, Francis's favorite Churchill line was, if you're going through hell, keep going. Because we were working really hard, and I claim we were working well and logically given the tools we had available to us, but we were making no meaningful progress in terms of the science. Um, that, of course, is not Winston Churchill. That's Gary Oldham. And Appears based on my search of literature, Churchill never said that. That's still a pretty good quotation in any event. But we did keep working at it. Um, and what really rescued us was technology. Um, there was actually a paper back in 1996, so relatively early on. Um, in the work we were doing uh, by Neil Rich, who I mentioned before was my academic older brother, and Kathy Maritangas, the psychiatric geneticist that, that he collaborated with. And what Neil and Kathleen proposed doing back in 1996 was to do what we now call genome-wide association studies. And the idea in a genome-wide association study is to type genetic markers across the whole genome on some people with a disease and some people without a disease, and do what we think of now as a case control study. We'll find it that way too. But do a case control study where we ask, are there particular genetic alleles that are more frequent in people with diabetes than with people without? Um, and Neil and Kathleen suggest that all you need is a few hundred thousand single nucleotide polymorphisms, basically single base misspellings in the genome. Um, and if you type those and looked for a disease marker association and picked those regions where there was association and said, those are my candidate regions for disease genes, that will allow me to narrow in on places in the genome I should pay attention. One reviewer, who is no longer anonymous, um, uh, said, this is science fiction. We have no way to type hundreds of thousands of markers. We don't even know of hundreds of thousands of markers. Oh, this can't be done. 
However, it could be done in the future, and so this anonymous reviewer said it'd be good for science to publish this paper. Um, and so it was published. The other reviewer had a similar set of comments. And this really has been the blueprint then for how we have gone forward successfully in complex disease genetics. It was science fiction at that moment, but it became science reality pretty quickly, and partly because Neil and Kathleen had had this insight that if we had this set of resources available to us, we could do this new kind of study. And so their insight then inspired companies, and these are different companies, you'll see this is quite an old slide uh, from my friend Steve Chanick at the NCI. This is cost per genotype, so one place in the genome for one person. Back when we were doing neurofibromatosis, it was probably 10 or 15 bucks. Um, in 2001, it would be something on the order of 50 cents, and 2010, something on the order of a, less than a penny. Um, and now, not too long ago, we designed an array to, to, to do more than <coughs> a million SNPs, a million single nucleotide polymorphisms, a million single-based misspellings in the genome um, for less than $50. And so, with this ability to type many, many genetic markers across the genome, for a very manageable cost, science fiction became science reality in, in a very short period of time, because it was really back here in 1996 this idea was proposed, and then moving forward, the catalog of variants was identified, and then the companies gave us ways to, to do the genotyping. Um, this is one of my favorite sayings. I think I made it up. I haven't found it anywhere else. When mana falls from heaven, say thank you and take advantage of it. And another simpler way to say that is just be opportunistic. Watch for what's going on in the world. When some new technology comes along, take advantage of it. And so that's what we and others did <coughs> in, in our diabetes work. And so we actually had just gotten our our grant from the NIH for, for doing this fusion study refunded. Uh, the grant was renewed in 2003. Our specific aim said, go back to these different places of the genomes, the genome we'd identified through our linkage analysis for those places that look the most likely to harbor a disease gene. Let's put a whole bunch of markers there and see if we can figure out if there is a disease gene. The really nice thing about a grant, rather than the contract, you can do whatever you darn well please. And so we took that money, and instead of doing you know, careful looks at these linkage peaks in the genome, which turned out to be false positives, actually, we said, let's instead carry out a genome-wide association study, as Ian and Kathleen had suggested, and as the company's good work made possible. <clears throat> and so we ended up doing one of the first genome-wide association studies, it was the first to use a technique called genotype imputation that Gonzalo Vacasis here on the left, on the right, was the first to develop. It was the first time of doing a GWAS combining data across multiple studies, so a GWAS meta-analysis. Um, and it was the opportunity for Andrew Skoll, who was a graduate student at that time, to develop methods for what we thought of as two-stage genome-wide association studies. And so this is a recurring theme. When you're doing interesting science, particularly if you're doing interesting science that not too many people have done before, there's opportunity for developing new methods. And the methods we developed for that study are still being very actively used. Yun Lee was another graduate student, uh, jointly with me and Gonzalo, and she was the one who had uh, developed imputation for her dissertation project. So Andrew's project, was to say, well, we've only got so much money, how can we invest it wisely in the studies we want to do? And so what we decided was, we were going to start out, I think I've got a slide this way over here, let me move to it. Nope, I didn't, I dropped it out. Okay, what we decided was we were going to start out with about 1,200 type 2 diabetes cases and about 1,200 controls. And we were going to type them with an array with about 300,000 genetic markers, Illumina's first generation array. 
And that was sort of what we could afford in terms of those arrays. And then we picked the best markers, maybe the best 1% or 2% of markers, and then follow them up um, in, in a similar number of people. And when we thought about how we should do the analysis, we thought, well, we could analyze all the data jointly, or we could use just the second set of data and just concentrate on those ones, on those markers that were interesting in the first set. And what Andrew showed is that if we did a joint analysis where we looked at all of the data simultaneously and paid for the fact that we had done 300,000 tests, that that strategy was a lot more powerful than just looking at the subset of data that came second. And what was extra exciting was that that two-stage design, which was much cheaper than just typing everybody on the array, gave us basically the same power. That's that vertical black line. That's the one-stage power. The blue lines are the two-stage design where we analyze the data jointly. And so what Andrew showed in his dissertation was we could take that two-stage design, save a bunch of money, and still have us still have the same um, still have the same power for analysis. So I get to say for the second time today, it's a sobering fact that I can show you one slide that summarizes about five years of work and have it show absolutely nothing. This summarizes our first genome-wide association study. Um, we again have chromosomes uh, along the bottom here, although they're at the top this time. This time, instead of a lot score, I have the log base 10 minus log base 10 of a p-value. And so a 6 up there is 10 to the minus 6, 1 in a million is the p-value. Now, if I were a clinical trialist, and I got a p-value of 10 to the minus 6, I'd be pretty excited. As a geneticist, where I'm doing hundreds of thousands of tests, 10 to the minus 6 just happens as false positives on a very regular basis. And so there's really nothing exciting there. Each of those little dots, by the way, is a different genetic marker. Now, it wasn't totally depressing, because three places in the genome uh, were what we knew as true positives. We knew TCF7L2 and KCNJ11 and PPR gamma were diabetes variants. And even though you can't tell, if we had stayed with our original design of following up sort of the best 1% of markers, those would have made it into the follow-up, and we probably would have found something interesting there. But it really was not our favorite result to see things look like that. We would have liked to have seen some more compelling results that would have said, here I am without these genes. The happy fact, though, was we had decided a year before that whatever we were able to do by ourselves, we could probably do better if we worked together with other people as well. And so David Altshuler, who was then at the Broad Institute, Mark McCarthy, who was then at Oxford University, um, and I decided that we would take our three separate studies, us with the fusion study, David with his uh, diabetes genetics initiative, Mark with the diabetes portion of the U uh, United Kingdom, um, I'm sorry, the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, agreed that we would put together our primary data, even before we had done any analysis, even before, certainly before we'd written a paper, and, and see what we could get if we put together three studies all at once. Um, there was one complication, and that was they had typed uh, a chip by the Appometrics company. Um, we had typed a chip by the Illumina company. Um, and the overlap between the chips was quite small. Happily, at this same time, and this is why Yun Lee and Gonzalo were on the previous slide, they developed this idea of genotype imputation, which says, because we're a relatively young species, if I know some of the genetic markers along a chromosome, I can use that information in a reference panel of more densely genotyped people to guess what the intermediate marker genotypes are. And so that process of genotype imputation allowed us to combine the data from the three studies in a principled sort of way. And so what that meant was, instead of having a study of about 1,200 cases and 1,200 controls in our first stage, similar numbers for follow-up, 
By combining the three studies, we had about 10,000 in our first stage and about 20,000 in the second. And that became a lot more fun. Because when we put those data together, we ended up with nine places in the genome where we had clear evidence for genetic variants predisposing to type 2 diabetes. Um, and for a group that had been failing for an awfully long time, it was really pretty fun to have what was pretty clear success. We ended up publishing three papers back to back to back in science. Laura Scott, I mentioned before, was the first author on our paper. Richard Saxini and Ellie Zaghini were the lead authors on the Broad and, and, and Welcome Trust papers. Time like this, they said it was the number five uh, most exciting thing in science that year. Science Magazine liked it and it said it was the breakthrough of the year in terms of human genetic variation. And it really took us from a place where we truly had been having no success to speak of in the context of complex disease genetics to having a method and an approach for going forward to try to better understand what the genetic basis of human diseases would be. Because by putting together data from multiple studies, we could increase our sample size, do a better job of um, uh, examining human genetic variation by doing imputation with a more complete set of the human genetic variation, like whole genome sequencing, we could look at more of the genetic variants across the genome and giving us a blueprint for going forward. And that's what we did. We ended up uh, between our first publications in 2006 and 2007 and now into 2014, um, we're able by combining more data with better imputation sets um, and going away from just Europeans, which was what we had started with, to allowing uh, inclusion of data from East Asians, South Asians, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, others, to, to substantially increase uh, the number of uh, places in the genome where we have clear evidence for type 2 diabetes predisposing variants. We're now at 450, actually. Um, and essentially, all of those, I believe, are right. You know, there are always potential for false, false positives in statistical analysis. These are variants with very substantial levels of evidence. One of the nice things, if you have a well-phenotyped set of individuals, if you're studying type 2 diabetes, you can also be studying a variety of other traits. And so, for example, we've worked routinely on glucose and insulin and body mass hit, uh, index, waist to hip ratio, lipids. Um, we've taken the same sort of approach of doing our analysis in our own studies, combining data across multiple studies through meta-analysis, and so we develop consortia that bring together data on these different sorts of traits and have ended up identifying thousands of loci for, for many of these traits. These are former postdocs of mine who have been involved in this work. So what I've talked about so far in the context of this, these genetic discovery studies is using genotype arrays, these things that Illumina and Afrometrics and others have created with these catalog of 300,000 to 500,000 or a million variants. That's just a snapshot of the genome. That's just a portion of the genome, the three billion base pairs that comprise the human genome. <clears throat> and so these array-based studies have had great success. Um, but there's also the possibility, and, and now we're doing whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing, where the exome is the portion of the genome that codes for protein. Um, sequencing, in contrast to these arrays, which give us these partial snapshots, sequencing allows us to look at all classes of genetic variation and all allele frequencies. So why haven't we been doing this all along? Why haven't we been doing sequencing all along? It's very expensive. That's exactly right. So this is a slide from the National Human Genome Research Institute, actually Adam Felsenfeld updates it every uh, three to 12 months, giving the price of sequencing a human genome. And so back in the days of the Genome Project, 
we first thought it would be about three billion base pairs, sorry, three billion dollars for three billion base pairs. It turned out to be somewhat less than that. By the time we got to where we were sort of starting with our genome-wide association studies here, it was down uh, around $30,000 to sequence the genome. We're now to the place where it's about $1,000 to sequence the genome. And so again, just as the genotyping arrays got cheaper, allowing us to have science fiction become science reality, so too that's happened in the context of sequencing. It's still expensive. A thousand bucks is still real money, but it's way different than 100 million. And so right now, we're actively involved in a variety of sequencing studies trying to ask some of the very same questions we were asking in the context of array-based studies about the impact of genetic variants and type 2 diabetes risk. Um, our current study that, that just was published in Nature uh, a few days ago uh, is based on a set of 45,000 individuals. This includes some of our FINS uh, and, and the other folks involved in the UK study and the, and the Diabetes Genetics Initiative study. But it involves also substantial numbers of Hispanic individuals in the US and Mexico, much of that funded by Carlos Slim. Uh, who uh, uh, is one of the richer people in the world and is a philanthropist and really interested in health. Um, African Americans, East Asians, and South Asians, a total of about 20,000 type 2 diabetes cases, about 24,000 controls. And in this analysis, we've looked at single variants, we've looked at genes, we've looked at sets of genes. And the interesting and somewhat sobering fact is when we're dealing with these large numbers of individuals, we still have limited power to detect strong effects for, uh, for, for rare variants. There just aren't that many. We found three genes in this study of 45,000 people. Um, and it made, we made it clear from some gene set analysis we did that it's probably going to take five times that many, probably 250,000, to, to really get to the kind of statistical power we want. Um, we're in the process of assembling that. We'll have that assembled by next year, I think, and we'll be doing a much larger study at that point. That, so that's one way to increase statistical power is to increase the sample size. Another way to increase statistical power is to have the variance be not so rare. And you, you can't totally control that, but one of the things that we've done, and now taking advantage again of being in Finland, which has an interesting population history, I don't know if you know, but much of Finland was settled something on the order of 2,000 years ago by a smallish number of people moving to the coastal areas of Finland. Um, that population was relatively constant for an extended period of time and then sort of exploded uh, in the last 500 years or so with some additional movements from the coast to the interior. Uh, of Finland, what's called the late settlement portion of Finland. The, re the, the reality of this is that, that some variants that are basically absent or at least very rare in the rest of the world end up being quite common in Finns. And so Finland can be a really useful place if you're trying to study what is otherwise rare genetic variation because variants that are in other places rare might be much more common. And so we put together a study uh, that's now uh, in press in nature. Uh, Adam Locke, my former postdoc, is the lead author, um, where we combine 10,000 people from uh, Kuopio, which is circled there on the map of Finland, 10,000 people from the FinRisk study, which is sort of that same central portion of Finland, uh, basically the green and the brown and the purple stuff there. <coughs> Um, for then a total of about 20,000 people. Um, we look then for association between type 2 diabetes and uh, the different genetic markers we type, and also for 64 other traits that were available to us on these people. Um, we found a whole bunch of genetic associations between these traits and, and different genetic variants. Um, and what was really interesting, and, and it corresponded to what we hoped might be true, was the variants we were finding association with were actually substantially more common in Finns than they were in other people. And so when we compare, for example, one variant uh, in a gene called THBSP4, a single allele change of that gene is associated with 
a six kilogram decrease in weight is a large effect. Okay? A large effect. Um, that variant is basically absent elsewhere. It's 35 times less frequent. And that's the kind of stories that we're seeing in these data um, that makes us really quite excited to continue the work um, in Finland. Okay, so I've spent most of my time talking about diabetes genetics because I think it's cool. And because after <laughs> lots of failure, we've had some interesting success. I think that by itself is an interesting story that if you are going through health, keep going. Keep trying to find good ways to go forward and be successful. Recognize that science is not a linear process where everything works and you just keep going from success to success. The other thing that I really like about our diabetes work is that it's consistently given us interesting scientific and interesting statistical problems to work on. And so Clement Ma, and Matthew Flickinger, and Corbin Quick, and Debashri Ray, and Ryan Welch are all former trainees of mine. Debashri is a postdoc, the other were, were, were graduate students, all of whom ended up working on interesting statistical problems that we had to solve because we were working with these different data types. Because we had data that you know, most people didn't have yet. Um, and happily, though, many people were going to have subsequently, which means that we develop methods that other people are going to have using. And, and I, I always tell my trainees, don't you know, let too much of your ego get tied up in your science because you lose objectivity. I'm going to try to tell myself that, too. One place where I have ego tied up in my science, I just love it when people use my methods. Um, it just is exciting to see that work that we do can have an impact on the science that, that other people do. Um, I mentioned before, very early on in answer to Pedro's question, that one of our criteria was we wanted to work in an area where there wasn't much competition. Well, happily, that worked out not to be true. We ended up with lots of competition. But thanks to that linkage analysis consortium, which found nothing, and convinced us, though, that we might be able to work together. And then working together with many, many different people on these different genetic studies I've described, that collaboration has enabled a lot of really good research. We're trying to foster that even further by basically bringing together as much of the world's type 2 diabetes genetics data as we can and data on related traits um, and making it accessible. Not the data itself, but but being able to do analyses and queries on those data so people can get as much information about diabetes genetics as possible. And I really believe that kind of sharing of not just data, but also information is, is really important as we try to go forward. Brian Welch, who I mentioned before, Andy Boughton, our programmer is working on that project. Okay, I want to mention this is sort of an aside, but it's, it's relevant. Um, you all are here for BDSI. It would be great if you decide you might be interested in pursuing graduate studies in biostatistics. We'd love to see you here. Um, since I'm talking about genetics, let me mention one of the good things about coming here if you are interested in statistical genetics. Um, we have a program called the Genome Science Training Program. Um, <coughs> It was one of the first such programs funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute. We're now in year 25. Actually, we'll be in year 25. We're year 24. Um, NHGRI invited several of us to come talk about what would we like to see training programs in genomics be. I came and suggested something that worked at the interface between the mathematical sciences and genetics would be, would be a good way to go. I was told at that meeting, no, we're not interested in that. Thanks for coming. Uh, happily, a week later, someone called me up and said, I think we're interested in that after all. So I, I went ahead and, and submitted the proposal for this program. As I say, we're now in year 24. Uh, we have 13 trainees, trainees a year. Uh, they can be either uh, pre-doctoral students, that is to say graduate students, or postdoctoral students. Almost all are, are pre-docs. Um, and it, we, we, we give a training where people have the opportunity to do their degree in biostatistics or human genetics or epidemiology or whatever it might be, but to get substantial training across disciplines and, and be truly an interdisciplinary scientist, which is what is necessary to be a successful statistical geneticist. 
So if you should decide you might be interested in this field after you've done your project or, 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 or from exposure you have, um, please feel free to, to let me know. I'd be delighted to talk about it. Okay. Um, journey lecture. So, a few lessons learned along the way. First one, and most important, is life is a grant, not a contract. Remember I talked about the fusion, it was a grant so we could change whatever we do. Life is a grant. Change whatever you do, whenever you want to do it. Do what you want, do what you think matters, do what is going to be exciting and fun, and will allow you to make a contribution in the way you'd like to do it. Take charge. Um, second, do work that has impact. You know, as you decide what you want to do in school, what you want to do after that, Pick something where you can do something that you think will impact the world in a way that you would like. Um, in my case, develop tools and methods that lots of people use. That's, that's something that to me is impact. Do science that might make a difference in determining new drugs or better targeting of drugs for type 2 diabetes. That to me is impact. Um, it's fun to do things that have impact. It's fun to do things with smart people um, who also are nice. Um, Work hard to be lucky. Um, some things you can't control. Francis Collins moving to Michigan the same year I did. Betsy Boxman sitting in a computer lab the same time I did. Those had nothing to do with any pre-planning on my part. Um, some things you can plan, like work with smart people in a good place, doing things where you have similar interests and corresponding and, and complementary skills. Those are things you can do to help yourself be lucky. <coughs> corresponding to this next piece of advice, choose places like a program for graduate school, like a school to go to, like a job, where if you do what you want to do and you do it well, they'll love you. People often ask me, students often ask me, well, should I go to a biostat department or a stat department or a human genetics department? Uh, this is my answer. It doesn't matter what the department is called. It doesn't matter what the company is called. Figure out what you would like to do and find a place where if you do that really well, it'll be a good match. Um, really important, when in doubt, do what you think is exciting and fun, and do it with the best people possible. And by best, smart matters, of course, but nice, and you like them, and it's good to interact. Most of us work pretty hard at our work, so picking work that you would do just because it's fun. I would volunteer for my work at this point. I'm damn glad I get paid for it. But at age 63, my kids all left home, I volunteer for the work I do. That's a really nice situation to be in. Really important, particularly at your career stage, anybody can be your mentor. A 10-minute conversation, what you've heard about two 10-minute conversations that totally changed my life. I'm mean, not to say I wouldn't be happy as a lawyer, but I can't imagine I'd be as happy as I am doing what I'm doing right now. Talk to people, ask for advice. People love to be asked for advice. It's flattering. Take advantage of that advice. Do appropriately listen carefully to what people say, but don't necessarily take the advice. Decide for yourself, is that good advice for me? Uh, Henry Tuckwell told me not to get married. That was not good advice for me. I listened carefully, but I ignored it after listening carefully. Um, life is full of triumphs and disasters. Celebrate the triumphs, even the small ones. Enjoy success. Because life isn't always success, so enjoy the ones that do happen. Enough sermon. So, in the work I've described, <clears throat> we've made a lot of progress in type 2 diabetes genetics. We have 240 places of the genome, 400 different signals that represent places in the genome that impact risks of diabetes, any one of which could help us determine a new drug, any of which could help us do better targeting of drugs, the combination of which can help us better decide people's risks of type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> and we've done similar work, and on, in, in many ways even more successful, because the sample sizes are larger for glucose and insulin and body mass index and other diabetes-related traits. Um, most of the variants we've detected, unlike the 6 kilogram difference in body weight, most of the variants we've detected through GWAS and sequencing have relatively modest impact individually. And it's only an aggregate that they make a big difference in disease risk. But, as I said a moment ago, they can be valuable when it comes to trying to understand etiology and trying to come up with better therapies. 
Um, sequencing is now allowing us to look at the full range of human genetic variation in the sense of all the different kinds of variants and all the different frequencies of variants, whereas with arrays, we were really looking at common SNPs. Something I haven't showed you, but is true, is that for the most part, common genetic variants, one of frequency 10% or greater, say, are basically the same throughout humanity. There are certainly exceptions to that, but mostly it's true because we all, our ancestors all either stayed in or came out of Africa. We're all Africans in that sense. And so most of the common genetic variation that exists, existed prior to the different diaspora out of Africa. And so we're basically the same when it comes to that common genetic variation. Rare genetic variation mostly has happened quite recently. And so we tend to be quite different individually or in different ancestry groups when it comes to rare genetic variation, which is part of the reason why it's so valuable to study different genetic diseases and traits, different diseases and traits, across the whole spectrum of humanity. <clears throat> I hope I've impressed upon you, even though it wasn't the primary focus of the talk, that everything we did here was statistical and computational. Everything we did required new statistical tools, new computational tools, to make those statistical tools practical to use. Um, and so if you're interested, in statistics and computation, but would like to do something in biology, and that's what I ended up doing, this is a great place to be. It's a great opportunity now, given the kinds of advances in technology we're seeing. And then last, working on exciting science provides opportunity to develop statistical and computational methods uh, that can be used by many folks. Um, suffice it to say, many, 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 many people contributed this. I'll just stop with that's my family, and those are my grandchildren. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. No. No. Did you notice that blue, blue was better than red on the slide back there? Um, in any event, no, my, my interest in politics remains very strong. It's absolutely essential to the, to the world that I want to live in, to be involved and active and thinking about what's going on in the world around us. But I don't think I would have been a good courtroom lawyer. Obviously, there are many other kinds of that. Other comments, questions? So, so I was totally infatuated with my wife when I first met her, and by the end of our first date, I knew this was the person I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, and I knew that very, very quickly that that, that was what was most important to me. And when we had kids, which I, you know, when I was 12, I knew I wanted kids. Um, Betsy and I actually decided on our first date we had three. I wanted two, she wanted four, we compromised with three. Um, um, we didn't have kids right away because I thought, you know, only knowing each other four months, that might be a little bit drastic to have kids just immediately. Um, but, but we knew we wanted to have kids and, and we knew that was going to be really important. Like, especially when you said biostatistics at the geology at the time, wasn't that solid at all? Like, that was quite fascinating to me that this was something like that. Yeah, and, and biostatistics and epidemiology were both very active. What was obscure was doing statistical human genetics, because human genetics was still a bit of a backwater at that point, and infectious disease epidemiology, because at that point, most um, epidemiologists, at least in the U.S., were really focused on chronic diseases. And so, so we knew that given the specific domains we wanted to work with, we were going to have to work hard to find jobs in the same place. And I, used to say I'd be a ditch digger before I'd live away from Betsy. Um, happily, I didn't have to do that, and at this point, there's no way in hell I could be a ditch digger, but uh, I don't have the strength for it. Uh, but those, those were both of our priorities. And, and honestly, 
it was really important that that was priorities for both of us and our priorities in the We were very lucky. stupidly not study biology anymore. Um, and so I had a lot to make up, but I actively decided that was an area I wanted to emphasize. And as I say, that's why I choose to buy my program to UCLA, because I would have to pass a PhD qualifying exam in biology. I knew that would force me to do what I thought I needed to do. Um, in our own program, Biostatistics, and I, as, as Kevin mentioned, I've been chair of our uh, admissions committee in Biostatistics ever since we had an admissions committee. Um, um, we certainly are single largest group of applicants are people with mathematics and statistics degrees. But we have substantial numbers of people from the natural sciences and the social sciences. We'll get the occasional French or philosophy major. Um, and you know that's not to say that that's the easiest road to hope. But you know I'm, I'm a deep believer that by bringing people with a diversity of backgrounds and diversity of interests, we actually make for a more interesting, a more fruitful, a better learning environment. Because as biostatisticians, you know, we don't close the door and use pencil and paper to prove lots of stuff. I mean, we do some of that. But, but what we're really trying to do is to influence what's going on in science. And collaborating with people is what we do. And so having a wide range of backgrounds represented amongst our students and our faculty and our staff models an environment that we as biostatisticians, as professionals, when we leave school, well, some of us never leave school, but when you all would leave school, um, or many of you would, it's the kind of environment you'll have to be working in, or will want to be working in. And so being able to model that in our own department, be able to model that during the graduate experience, I think is very well. We said 
You know, here's what we've got, but there's no compelling signals. In contrast, in the more recent work where we're talking about these genome-wide association studies, I'm not going to bet the firstborn son of the house, but I bet you, you know, as much as I ever bet on anything, that essentially all of those are true positives. Um, we are really quite careful in our field of statistical genetics to demand very substantial evidence before we make conclusions. Um, my, my standard line with my students is if we find something, we've got some exciting result, the first thing we try to do is kill it. You know, do anything you can reasonably do, do a different analysis, a different approach, a different set of assumptions. Can you kill that result? Um, sometimes you can't. And that doesn't mean it's wrong. Sometimes you can't. That doesn't mean it's right. But it gives you a greater degree of confidence in what you're doing. Um, so sorry if I gave a misimpression. And what we're doing now, I think we have very few false positives in our particular branch of statistical genetics. And in fact, there's there's been some controversy, some, con some discussion, I guess we better say, in, in, in statistics in terms of what sort of p-values that we should consider as significant. Um, O5 is sort of a standard thing that's been in the literature for a long time. This group of people is arguing for 0.005 because it um, more appropriately corresponds to uh, posterior odds of, of, of the alternative hypothesis to be true of 21 which is how a lot of people interpret a p-value of 0.05. Um, in that set of papers that were written, they specifically single out statistical genetics as being particularly good at being particularly careful in ensuring the results are not false positives. So I didn't mean to give that a question. Um, this is more of a general question, but you uh, mentioned a lot in your presentation So I deeply believe in vacation. Um, and um, so don't tell anybody, but I'm supposed to take no more than four vacation weeks a year. I mean, that's phenomenal, but what, what, uh, I'm, I'm out of here at least two months a year. And you know, even when I'm on vacation, I'm working some, because I've got enough people working with me, working for me, that I can't just totally ignore my work. But I, I just believe it's important. And I work really hard when I work. Um, but part of the reason I can do that, even at age 63, is I allow myself time away. And I, I value doing other things. Uh, Betsy and I are taking the two grandchildren over the weekend this weekend. Uh, I let my parents have a little bit of time off. And that's partly because I like giving my kids a good deal. But it's partly because I really like the grandchildren. Um, you just have to make the decision of what's important. And you have to. It really helps if when you're deciding on a place to go, if you're deciding on a place to work, if you're deciding on people to work with, to find people who are like-minded. Um, one of the great things about academia is family-friendly is something that for most major universities is, is really quite high on the list. Um, it's, it's easy for me as a 63-year-old who could quit anytime I wanted to and you know, there would be no problem in terms of my finances to say I've got a lot of flexibility. But even when I was an assistant professor, uh, I would go in and every Friday morning I'd work in the kids' school and help them out in the school. So fundamentally, you have to make choices and decide that things are important to you. It certainly does help if you go to a place where people around you are supportive of those choices. Um, I have a named chair. It's named after a man named Richard G. Cornell, who was the chair of this department when uh, I joined the faculty, he's recently died. But, but one of the reasons I asked to have my chair name for him was he made very clear to me and to Betsy when we first arrived that he thought it was not only appropriate but really important to take time to do things with our kids. And I really appreciate that. There's another question. Yeah. What's the most challenging part of your job? Um, so there are different ways to answer that question. The most irritating part of my job is email. Um, I mean, I thank God for email, because if we didn't have it, we couldn't get a lot of the things done we do. And honestly, I couldn't go on as many vacations as I did for good conscience. Um, but I find it just irritating to, to deal with the mounds of email. 
In terms of true challenges, um, it's, it's trying to be the best mentor I can be for my students and recognizing that I have strengths and weaknesses as a mentor and everybody has their strengths and weaknesses as a trainee and how to make that work as well as possible. That's something I, I, I spend a fair amount of time thinking about, brooding about, worrying about, trying to do better. Um, obviously, getting grant funds for my research is something that I spend a lot of time on. I've been really lucky, and so what often could be a really hard challenge is mostly ended up being a pleasure. But still, it's still a lot of work. Um, those would be probably the things I think. Um, what I also say, though, is, man, if those are the worst things I've had to deal with, I've been really lucky in my hands because there's so much that I love about the job of an academic. I get to decide what I want to do, with whom I want to do it, when and how I want to do it. I get to surround myself with really smart, really nice people of all ages, of all sorts of characteristics. Um, so, so the challenges are really, for me at least, seem really small compared to the opportunity. And there was one more question I thought I saw. Yep. Yeah, well, mine was going back to the key value. Um, uh -huh. So, like, in genetics, it's kind of happening just, like, recently, I guess, because I was in, in, in the genetics group, and the other day I was seeing, like, association groups with, like, so they have six genes. So, so the 10 to the minus 6 is basically what you need to choose to assume you're only going to have one false positive of genome-wide search for common variants. 5 times 10 to the minus 8, which is what we typically use, says we want only a 5% chance that in a genome-wide scan we'll end up with a false positive. And that's basically a 20-fold difference between 10 to the minus 6 and 5 times 10 to the minus 8. Um, now, as we go and are start looking at more rare variants across the genome, we probably need a more restrictive p-value than that. 5 times 10 to the minus 9, or even a bit smaller, is probably going to be what we're going to need to do as we go to more and rarer variants. And it might end up even being smaller than that. And the issue here, of course, is that we're doing many, 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 many tests. And so, you know, if we're doing a million tests and we chose a p-value of 0.05 is significant, well, we've got 50,000 false positives right off. You know, it's, it's that kind of issue we're dealing with. And how do we do that creatively and carefully to maximize power, but not to fool ourselves, as we were talking about a moment ago, with, with a, a large number of false positives. And that was an area back in the bad old days when we are in genetics didn't have very good tools, or we didn't have great power. And people would say, well, I just tested one marker. The p-value is less than 0.05. That has to be exciting, isn't it? We got lots of false positives in genetic studies in those days. I'm happy to claim that we weren't involved in that, but, but a lot of people did. Other questions? Genome Science Training Program, I'd be more than delighted to chat. Thank you very much.